Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you to my channel. Thank you very much for finding me. And if you're new here, I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne without a greenhouse or grow lights or humidifiers or equipment, just me and them either inside or outside or not at all. So plant lovers, if that sounds like your bag, do hit subscribe. I post every Friday. I am a complete amateur, but do join me so that you too can enjoy my amateur ramblings. And the subject of today's video is this charming rambling, talking of rambling plant, and this is Gomesa flexuosa, which I have featured before. Now, I bought this plant, uh, oh, it's a few months ago now, as you can see, there's the dead flower spike. It was in bloom from um, an orchid society plant sale, which happens biannually, which is the most exciting thing that could ever happen to an orchid enthusiast. Fabulous plant. As you can see though, the habit of this plant is that it's a climber. It wants to cling epiphytically to the side of a tree and reach for the stars, although in a shady spot. So the eternal question is, well, how do you grow it when you are not somewhere that you could attach it to a tree? And a few of you had suggestions when I showed you the plant um, when I bought it in bloom, and I'll drop those uh, images in now. So I was pondering, 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 thinking, hmm, it needs to essentially have some kind of basket to contain some medium and some, uh, some of the roots, but it also needs something that it can cling to and grow up. And so I was just Googling, 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 and there is an orchid supplier, an orchid supply supplier, not plants, but equipment that I often buy things from. And I was looking on their website and they had what I think is the perfect solution. <gasps> but let's get to that in a minute. Let's just talk about uh, Gomesa flexuosa for a minute. So uh, dropping in the pictures of the flowers now, it is what's kind of known commonly dancing lady orchids. So there's yellow, very beautiful oncidium-like orchids. And this is sometimes referred to as an oncidium, but Gomesa is the genus it belongs to and the correct name according to Q. So it's a, it's a classic orchid of its type. And I've never had any luck with them. I have to say, I've got a few, <sighs> yeah, who knows? Anyway, I'm hoping that I do a little better with this. So the range of this orchid is sort of the coast of Brazil and then Argentina, Paraguay. So that sort of bit of, I guess, central South America along the coast and sort of inland a little bit. And it does grow to quite high elevation, so it can take quite cool temperatures. Now it's described as a cool to warm grower. However, I do know that lots of growers in Australia in southern Australia grow this cold, which means they grow it outside without any heat, usually um, in a shade house or undercover under protection like me, but with no heat. So that's what I'm going to do. So although you might not think it could take those chilly winter nighttime minimums, it can. Well, we'll see. Anyway, the name Gomesa, interestingly, was given to this genus by Robert Brown in 1815. Now, he is a gentleman we've come across before. He was Scottish and a passionate botanist and explorer, and he traveled the world in the seven seas, as Annie Lennox may have said, naming things left, right, and center. And he actually came to Australia in the very early 19th century and named a whole raft of plants here as well. But he was in Brazil and named this after a Portuguese Renaissance man from the late 18th, early 19th century called Dr. Bernardino Antonio Gomez. And he was a naval physician and a botanist and an author anyway. So Mr. Brown, our Scottish intrepid explorer, named this genus of orchids after him. And the flexuosa bit, mm, not so difficult, is it? Generally means bending in the opposite direction or alternating. And if we look at the dead flower spike, what you can actually see sort of in the skeleton is how each part of the spike sort of branches where there was a bloom. So it's sort of bivaricating, I think that is the word, when the branch goes, uh, 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 uh. anyway. Uh, so there you go, flexuosa, ta-da. Okay, let us move this aside and let me now get my box of tricks. So there is uh, an orchid supply company in Australia called, cunningly enough, Orchid Den, and I ordered a box of supplies from them. And let me just show you the things that I decided to get. I've got many things. But unrelated to this project, look what they have. Smaller hanging baskets. You see how small that is? 
It's really hard to find metal hanging baskets that are the right size for orchids. Um, generally, garden centers and hardware stores have much bigger ones. Smaller ones, there you go, plant lovers. Um, now, the company's called Orchid Den, and I'll put the link below. Um, this is not an ad, I have no relationship with them. I just happen to buy things from them. They are Australian, so I really doubt if they're gonna ship internationally. So all of you viewers um, in other parts of the world, if you just Google around orchid supplies in your area, you'll find someone, there'll be someone in your country or your region that is selling things not dissimilar to this. So my solution to how do I grow a climbing epiphyte is Tree fern slabs. Look at that. There's actually two in there and I'll unwrap them later on. So these are wide but narrow pieces of tree fern. Isn't that just perfect? But wait, there's more. So there's our tree fern. That's going to be the back of our planting program. And then what they sell are these little baskets. Now, as you can see, it has got these spikes and you literally push that through your tree fern log like that, bend them around, and ta-da, you've kind of got a customized basket with tree fern slat at the back, which you can then just hang up and your orchid can go for it. Isn't that brilliant? I am so excited. I also just got a smaller little bit of tree fern log, which you could do the same thing with, except our friend Gomesa flexuosa is gonna to be too big, but you just do the same thing with that. So there we are. That was my wonderful box of tricks from Orchid Den. And then what you just need to line your basket is some loose coconut fiber. Now you can get this from any hardware stores, but you can in Australia. Uh, in the hanging basket section, you should be able to find bags of it loose, or you can also get it from the same kind of orchid supply company. And I'm just gonna line that basket with this. So plant lovers, I think without any further ado, we should repot this and see how we go. Well, here we are. So let's go through our ingredients first, like a good TV chef. So we've got some slow release fertilizer. We've got some mycorrhizal fungi. I've got some wire so I can fashion a hook for my piece of tree fern log. And this is the mix I'm going to use in the basket, which is medium sized bark, sphagnum moss and perlite all mixed together. And then our plant, plus some loose coconut fiber to actually line the basket. Okay, let's unearth our tree fern fiber and just see how easy it is or isn't going to be to poke this through that. It might be a little harder than one imagined. So there we go. There we go, quite messy. And there is our piece of fiber. Now I can tell you right away, it is not that strong, so bear that in mind. Um, but I think it's going to be very easy to poke my way through this. So let's just see if I can do that. Okay, let's see how easy or not <laughs> this is to push through. I'm thinking I might need to drill. Oh no, there we are, ha ha, success. Right. Goodness me, there we are. Now let's push that all the way through, like that, and like that. Wow, my goodness, I'm incredibly happy with that. Now all I have to do is bend those over like so, and this one like so. There we are, all right. Very, very excited. Now, I haven't gone too close to the bottom just because I didn't want to maybe break or split it off. So I've gone, that is about an inch or about two and a half centimeters from the bottom and a little bit similar distance from the side there. Okay, now let's see if I can as easily poke through my piece of metal to make the hook. Oh yes, it's going in. And yes, there we are. That is quite easy to get through. So what we've learnt is that tree fern log is actually quite easy to work with. So I'm just going to literally twist this around like so to give myself a hanging loop. Look at that, magnificent. Okay, now the next step 
is just to give myself something to keep it vertical while I'm just filling the pot. So I've just got a large old terracotta pot here. Okay, so let's line our basket. So we've lined our basket with coconut fire, but it actually looks like a beautiful bird's nest. So the idea is that the aerial roots of the plant can cling to this um, tree fern log and just grow up. Anyway, there we go. What I might do now is just unpot the orchid to get a sense of how much root mass there is, which will determine how much um, medium I need to mix. Okay, here's our wonderful plant. Let us unstrap it. Okay, let's see what's going on in the pot. Right, so you see not much. So there we have our stem really where the plant was cut. And you can see really that um, it is not a plant that particularly wants to be rooted in medium. So here we've got some active roots towards the bottom and I would say most of these look quite dead, but there is a beautiful new root just forming. Um, let me have a look. Yes, these are all quite dead. What I might do is just trim off these dead ones just to clean up the base a little bit. Being careful not to damage any of those new roots. So there we go, there's our cleaned up stem. Now you can imagine that there is the real risk of rotting that if you get it too moist. So that is something particularly in winter to be careful of. Can you see those beautiful green active growing tips there? So this plant is really wanting to cling to something. Now, oh my goodness, I've just noticed here, might be another flower spike, wowza. So you can see where the flower spike comes from, from the base of the pseudobulb, so as in any other orchid, except that this one is quite clearly growing up. So as the plant grows up, you'll get flower spikes coming out successively up the plant. So if we just peel back that little sheath, you can see where it comes from there. So this is the spent flower spike, and I will just cut that off now as we don't need it anymore. Thank you, flower spike, you gave me joy. So let's just have a little look at the end, which gives you that clue to the name flexuosa. So you can really quite see how the spike alternates in direction from one bud to the next. So it zigzags, hence that name flexuosa. Interesting. Anyway, it's quite beautiful, isn't it? Although it's like some kind of weird spindly green chicken claw. <laughs> okay, so here is our plant. And I think that medium, let me have a smell. Hmm. It's okay, I feel that I might want to just freshen it up. So I am going to use new medium. So here is my bowl. Just going to break that up. And you know what I'm deciding? I'm making an executive decision not to use the sphagnum. I don't want this to be too moist. I want it to dry out quite quickly. It does come from a part of the world that does have dry seasons. So um, particularly in winter, I wanna make sure that it's not kept too moist. So I'm removing the sphagnum moss. All right, let's give that a little bit of a mix. So let's get back to our pot and let's get our fabulous plant. And I am just going to literally rest it like that. Let me tilt this up so you get a better view. So at this point, I'm actually not going to need to pin the plant because I just think physics is gonna keep it in place, but let's see. So the stem, uh, I'm gonna bury a reasonable amount and let's just see how we go. I'm gonna keep it super light and airy around that base. I am not really trying to compress this too much. I'm just literally filling the basket. Next thing, this is really for spring because this is a slow release fertilizer that's activated by warmer temperatures. So it's not gonna be really doing much now, but it will start to activate in spring when the weather gets warmer. And a little bit of mycorrhizal fungi. So this is essentially the spores of the fungi. So you just put a little bit in there as you would cayenne pepper in a spice dish. 
basically that is the spores of the fungi which will then grow throughout the medium. And mycorrhizal fungi has a symbiotic relationship with the plant. It promotes healthy root growth, but it also enables the plant to get nutrients and moisture from soil. And the mycorrhizal fungi gets energy from the sun through photosynthesizing via the plant. So, symbiosis. Well, there we are, plant lovers. I have to say, that was a whole lot easier than I had imagined. So there is the finished craft project. <laughs> I've just realized, though, that quite quickly, this plant is gonna reach the top. But I think what you saw from that stem is that essentially you would just cut it and I'm just gonna cut the stem and stick that stem back in the basket at the bottom when it gets to the top of my fern tree slab. So what I'm gonna do now is give it a good watering and in that water, I'm going to put a seaweed based tonic. So it's not a fertilizer, it's a tonic. It's just full of lots of biological gorgeousness. And I dilute that down to about one eighth, one tenth of the recommended dose. So it's quite weak, just to settle in the plant. And I do that with everything that I've repotted. Also, it's a good idea if whenever you receive things um, shipped to you, either from eBay or from an internet purchase, it's always a good idea to water the plants for the first time with such a seaweed based tonic or a worm juice tonic, just to, you know, give it a bit of a fillip, a bit of a cocktail after its traumatic travels. And then, as you can see, I am hanging it up in bright indirect light where it can hopefully thrive and prosper outside all year, under cover, protected from the rain, but still getting cool winter and nighttime minimums. I am gonna keep this on the dry side in winter. Uh, I'll just probably mist it and try not to keep um, the medium damp, but I will certainly be keeping the tree fern log damp. So the other thing actually about tree fern logs is that like this one right now is very dry. So in fact, thinking about it, what I should have done is soaked it first. So tree fern logs become uh, hydrophobic when they're dry. So they're water repellent and you really need to drench it and soak it to enable it to get wet again, to enable it then to absorb moisture more easily. So hmm, tactical error there, but never mind. I'll give the tree fern bark a good drenching. That flower spike in there, which I think we just observed, I'll keep you up to date with that because if this blooms, I'll be beside myself. But thank you very much for watching this craft session. I hope uh, it may be of use to you in trying to figure out how you can perhaps grow orchids that have that similar running habit. Um, there are a few, so you might find it useful. As I said, I'll put the link below for Orchid Den where I bought the equipment from. As I did mention, they probably won't ship internationally, but you'll be sure to find somewhere in Europe, in North America, wherever you are, that is an orchid um, supply specialist. Just have a Google around, and I'm sure you'll be able to find someone who can ship you tree fern bark, smaller baskets, coconut fiber, et cetera, et cetera. So good luck on your search. Plant lovers, thank you for watching. I do post every Friday, so if you enjoyed this, hit subscribe to find out what my very amateur journey might be next week. And whatever it might be, I look forward to seeing you. So take care wherever you are and see you next week.